Welcome to Fort Knox once again. It's been a little while. I'm John Fort here this time with George Kurtz, CEO, co-founder of CrowdStrike. Uh, great to have you, George. I, I always start off with the same general question and then um, go deeper on it. But what's the toughest problem that you're solving for today? Beyond the obvious of there's lots of crooks out there who are trying to crack into customer systems. Well, the toughest problem that we're solving today when I started the company in 2011 is, is stopping breaches. And, uh, you know, that's a simple concept, but really hard to do in practice. And, and one of the things that I focused on when I started the company was to just think about that concept a little bit differently. Uh, at the time, I was working for McAfee and, and there was Symantec and all the others that were out there and they were focused on stopping malware. And I sort of just turned the concept on its head and said, well, if people are paying for security outcomes, they should be focused on stopping breaches, not just malware. And there are many things uh, that can uh, impact a company and cause a breach outside of just malware. Um, so in the context of today's threat environment, where we've seen um, uh, you know, ransomware attacks uh, that are tied to crypto payments on the other side. We've seen the rise of this zero trust idea where it's not so much about keeping bad people out, but assuming that um, bad people could be in at any given moment. What, what, what's the unique value proposition of your approach to the technology? Well, the approach that we took uh, is to really focus on the endpoints and the workloads and the cloud work, you know, servers and the cloud workloads, right? So um, that's different than some of the network players that are out there, some of the email firewall vendors. And it really is the tip of the spear of where a breach happens. If we think about, you know, network breach, yeah, I mean, network is just the highway that the bad guys are going to go to get to the your desktop and your servers and your cloud workloads. So the approach that we took was to really think about it in the same way that Salesforce did. How do we create a, a, a in the cloud platform that has lots of data, lots of smarts using AI and a small little lightweight agent, which is a piece of software that runs in any of these workloads to identify and prevent against breaches. But we go beyond that. There's a lot of other IT related data that we collect and we're providing value uh, above and beyond just the security piece of it. I've, I've often wondered why security um, as a technology business is so choppy, at least in the results. Uh, if you look at security stocks, uh, no matter whether it's a uh, well-established or, or well-loved company that has a record of, of finding breaches and, and correcting these problems, it's hard to sustain long-term momentum, it seems, versus consumer product companies that have uh, established platforms. Why would you say that is? Well, it's really a good question and uh, it, it's a great observation. And it, in fact, it's funny. It's, it's one of the, the big questions that we had when we uh, took the company public in 2019, <clears throat> which is uh, from investors, which is why is this story different this time? And it's different for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it really starts with the platform and the, the business model. So when I started the company, you, you know, if you look outside of security at Salesforce and Workday and ServiceNow, all respective cloud platform leaders, there really was no cloud platform. It just didn't exist. It wasn't Checkpoint or Mac or Semantic or Palo Alto or whoever. It just wasn't there. So we started with a, a cloud platform. And then what's different is the fact that we're not selling boxes and we're not selling uh, something that sort of comes and goes. And in the past security, uh, you know, you had something that was hot, then it wasn't. <clears throat> and the way I built the platform and, and the CrowdStrikers who helped uh, do this uh, is really focused on collecting data one time, putting it into uh, our thread graph, which analyzes data, and then creating new workflows on top of it, which are modules. And those are all licensed on an annual uh, you know, contract basis. So what we have is very predictable uh, annual recurring revenue. We have high growth rates and the, the technology delivery is SaaS, but also the, the revenue model is SaaS and we've got a big enterprise business. So we've taken a lot of the variability out of the security uh, sort of ups and downs that you've seen with other companies in the past. In an environment where there's high turnover, um, in the labor market and so probably in a lot of customers and where the customer probably has to in a lot of cases be pretty sophisticated in how they use even good software good services to protect 
the the enterprise. How do you do that? How do you make it uh, current enough to be effective, but easy enough to actually be used? Well, one of the things that I focused on when I started the company was to really think about how do you create a consumer experience uh, in the enterprise? And in today's environment, where all of iPhones or Androids, you know, we know how to click on websites and get information very quickly. And it should be the same way in the security uh, domain. Uh, in the past, security was just too hard. It was too complex. It was, you know, on-premise systems you have to set up. They didn't work. They were using signatures. Uh, one of the things that we did was, A, we made it really easy to install and get immediate time to value. Things like not requiring a reboot, right? So when you go into a large bank, 500,000 endpoints, you can't just reboot the entire business. The second piece, though, <clears throat> is a lot of what we do is focused uh, on artificial intelligence. So instead of having these signatures that are always out of date and need updating, we create algorithms that, you know, maybe we update them every quarter, um, but it's a very small mathematical model and it allows us to stay ahead of the, uh, the bad guys. And the last piece of this <clears throat> is really the crowd and the crowd strike. It's the crowdsourcing aspect of what we do. We've got agents or our software that runs in 176 different countries. We collect 7 trillion events per week and we, we basically aggregate all that data, train our algorithms. And it's this community immunity aspect that allows us to continue to keep our customers safe. Uh, how much is M&A necessary? Uh, can, can you keep all of the innovation or germinate all or most of the innovation you need within the company? And uh, in this environment of some falling valuations, both public and eventually private, how does that position you if you are or are not interested in doing M&A? Mm -hmm. Well, we have focused since the beginning on innovation. That's one of the areas that CrowdStrike is known for. We've developed a lot of technologies before they even had names that some of the analysts have given them like managed detection response, uh, which helps, uh, you know, kind of help manage all these, uh, this technology for customers. But when we think about the acquisitions uh, that we've done, uh, companies like Cumio in the log management, uh, really observability space, uh, we think about uh, some technology we bought in the data protection space. We've been very opportunistic and focused on buying very innovative technology companies with great cultures, great technology, but less of a go-to-market. So we can put it in our go-to-market. And we continually evaluate companies on a weekly basis. As you might imagine, it's pretty busy with what lots of bankers wanted to bring new companies to us, but the bar is very high. And in the current environment, uh, you know, we're sitting on a lot of cash. We know the valuations have come down both in the, in the public and the private markets. And uh, we're going to be very selective, but we're going to understand what opportunities may present themselves that we could fold into our platform and would be a good fit for us. So along those lines, uh, I believe you said in a, in a recent earnings call, 69% um, of your customers subscribe to four or more products, uh, more than half to five or more. Um, what determines the effectiveness of, I mean, it sounds kind of uh, crass to call it an upsell, but um, is it you figuring out what the customer needs and the product match to that, that increases that stickiness and that share of wallet? Is it something else? Uh, have you found, um, even in an environment where customers, you know, budgets might feel a bit more constrained than they'd like, what might continue to work? Well, it starts with the platform itself, Falcon, and um, it, it's how we designed it, right? We have a single agent, right? Which is that piece of software that runs on your computer. Uh, we have a single data store, which is the threat graph, and then we've got modules on top of it. So customers may start with our next-gen antivirus product, um, our endpoint detection response product, uh, which gives you visibility, you know, our Overwatch, which is a managed threat hunting service. They may start there. And then over time, they add new modules into uh, endpoint device control or data protection or you know, uh, intelligence uh, IT operations. The, the beauty, though, of what we built is that when we collect the data one time, we can then reuse that data for the other modules. And that, that, that's great for customers because we can reduce their overall agent count. And in, a, in an enterprise environment, there's 13 agents that run on the computer, which is why when most people... and I'm sure your audience has experienced this. They turn on a computer, they wait 15 minutes, it grinds away, they go get coffee, they come back and, you know, and then they're, they're kind of, you know, limping along. 
we take all of that off, you know, off the table and we reduce the aging count to give a better experience. We save money and uh, have a better outcome. And the product and the platform actually has an e-commerce element to it and it understands what the customer has. And we can selectively provide new in-trial applications with the data we've already collected and allows us to be very efficient in our selling motion, which is why we have a, a magic number of 1.4, which is meaning it, it's a very high efficiency in terms of its, our selling motion and the dollars we spend on it. So do I understand correctly, it's almost like an automatic try before you buy type situation where you're able to tell based on your data, hey, this customer might benefit from having this module. So let's give them a trial of it. Uh, and then that it makes the sale easier because they've already been using it, seeing what it's been doing. OK, would you like us to pull this back or would you like to start paying for it? Absolutely. So let me give you a good example of that. So vulnerability management is a big uh, concern for many companies. That is finding all the vulnerabilities. Many of them are Microsoft in the environment uh, and they've got to get those patched. Well, if you're just using our, our AV product, right, we've already collected all the information related to the vulnerabilities. All we need to do is light that up in our module, give you a 15 day trial, which we have, and then uh, go through the selling motion to convert you into a paying customer. And that could be with a sales rep or an inside salesperson. And the beauty of that trial is it's your data. So think about this. We have some big banks, you know, that are 500, 600, 800,000 endpoints, literally to try the product across their entire environment. They, know, they don't need to install another agent. They literally click the trial button. It's all their data. They get 15 days of value. And then there's the upsell. Now, how we actually do this is very subtle. So when there's a um, Log4j, which was a big kind of vulnerability that was out late last year, we actually knew what customers had our vulnerability management spotlight product. And if you were coming in when that, you know, during that Log4j, you probably were really concerned and we would actually just say, hey, why don't you try this product for 15 days? We can solve your Log4j problem. And it was a really friction-free way to get people to try new modules. So it gets to the enterprise experience that has been consumerized uh, to get people to try things in a very friction-free manner. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that must have been because they felt like they got real value immediately. Um, I'm curious how many people stuck around and how many felt like, well, solve that problem for me. There's, there's nothing else like that around. Probably people know that there's, there's always something lurking. Um, normally I, I might not ad address a, a question like this at this time, but since we're talking about it, um, Jamie Anderson asked, can you address the challenges regarding localization, especially with scale? Uh, you mentioned banks. Um, they tend to be pretty complicated entities with lots of branches. Um, some of them globally and the, um, the security challenges and, and laws are different. How does your platform handle that? Well, it, it, it's kind of a broad question. There's localization and things like language, which we have for, for multiple language support. But then the, the, the bigger challenge, which I think might be at the heart of the question, is when you think about how complex the regulatory environments are, the data privacy laws, the, the, the compliance issues, uh, we have a whole team, just like most cloud providers, that focus on you know, what does it mean in a particular country or a particular region? How do we make sure we satisfy all those requirements? Uh, because it's cloud uh, delivered, um, it allows us to very quickly uh, get to new geographies, but we have to be able to operate effectively in those environments. We do have local clouds in, in you know, Europe and, and in other areas, uh, which makes data, data sovereignty uh, a bit easier. But we have spent a lot of time over the last 10 plus years in making sure that we can check the box uh, and more than check the box and solve a lot of potential compliance or regulatory issues. Uh, and just to give you an example, we've got 15 of the top 20 world's largest banks. They are all over the world. They've got a lot of compliance issues and we've managed to solve those for each and every one of those. Now, so we talked a, a, a bit about CrowdStrike, the company. Now I'd like to get to know more about you um, as a leader. And I like to start from the very beginning. So tell me, where were you born? Um, tell me about your household, parents, siblings. Sure. I was born in New Jersey and uh, grew up there and, um, you know, pretty modest means. My dad passed away when I was uh, super young and uh, it was one of those things, you know, you had to put yourself through school and and uh, figure it all out, uh, which is what I did. And, and uh, I was always a, a computer guy, I guess, uh, or a kid. 
So I started programming when I was in fourth grade. But when I went to college, I didn't want to be a mainframe program programmer. And that was in the 80s. Uh, so I got an accounting degree and actually started my career in uh, at Price Waterhouse before the before the Coopers merger. Um, somehow, I, if you can imagine this, I managed to convince someone at one of our clients, this was in accounting, right, for auditing, um, that I needed access to their mainframe computer because it was really laborious to take all the information and copy it down and then use a 10 key to actually add it all up. So Talk about um, a security risk. Yeah, what a security risk. So somehow I convinced uh, this was a big pharmaceutical company. They gave me access to the mainframe, you know, under the guise of being, you know, Price Waterhouse. I automated the entire uh, sort of audit of pulling all these numbers out. And I was either going to get fired or promoted uh, because I cut the bill by hours in half. Um, I got promoted into the management consulting group. And in 1993, I was the fifth person in the Price Waterhouse security group. Um, and that was just as an emerging uh, area. And then uh, over time, I did that. I wrote a book called Hacking Exposed in 99, which became the, the number one hit in security. It started my first company, Foundstone, in vulnerability management and sold that to McAfee in 2004 and then spent seven years with them before starting CrowdStrike. Now, we, we breezed through New Jersey uh, a lot faster than I want. I'm, I'm actually sitting in New Jersey right now in Inglewood Cliffs. Um, so... Tell me more about that growing up period. Where in New Jersey were you? Um, how old were you when your family went through that tragic chain of events? Uh, I well, I grew up in Parsippany, and um, you know, again, modest, uh, pretty modest upbringing. Um, my dad passed away when I was seven, uh, so you know, again, we didn't we didn't have a lot of money. We just needed to to sort it out, uh, put myself through school, and. You know, when you're in New Jersey and, you know, I'm not sure if you just work in there or live there, but I mean, that, that's kind of can be a rough and tumble uh, area in many places. Um, you know, great people, but it's it's, uh, you know, it's hard nose. So uh, yeah. you, you got to you got it's either sink or swim. And I think, you know, that background has really helped me because I think, um, you know, a lot of successful people have had some level of sort of, uh, you know, stress in their life or, or tragedy or something that sort of um, gave them a spark, you know, to really set them on a journey to be successful. Um, you know, so that's, that's what I did when I was in New Jersey. And then so, uh, later in life, I moved to California. So what were you into as a kid? And did you have extended family around? Um, was it just you and your mom? Any siblings? Yeah. Uh, just my mom uh, had a sister and uh, myself and that was it. Not a lot of family that was around. Uh, for the most part. And, um, you know, grew up playing sports. I played just about everything that was out there, baseball, football, wrestling, running, swimming, did that until I stopped growing. Um, then all those, all those tall guys tend to, tend to be a little bit be better and faster. Um, and really got into computers. Uh, my, I think my first computer was a Commodore uh, CBM, like a pet green screen kind of a thing. And you know, the rest was history. Ran bulletin boards when I was in uh, high school and, you know. Where'd you get introduced to the computer? I got introduced uh, in school, actually, uh, in fourth grade. They had these Commodore, you know, these old CBM, like, pet computers. Uh, I'd probably date myself a little bit, but they were all in one and, you know, programmed in basic. And, um, you know, you can go beyond that and, and some of the assembler and things. But um, that's how I got into computers and, and was always fascinated and, uh, you know, loved what you can do with it. And that, um, you know, I was always trying to figure out how to beat the system, I guess, even in, in fourth grade, you know, on the computers. And uh, that's probably so how did that how did that manifest itself? Because often there were rules about who got to use the computer and when and what you could do on it. And this is just for math programming, not for making or playing games. And what was what was your angle on beating the system? Well, it was, it was always, uh, it was probably more of a, you know, uh, a physical hack than, uh, than a virtual, than a computer hack, because at the time there were, there were no security software, the viruses weren't even, you know, you haven't even heard of these things. Um, so it was really just trying to convince the teacher to get more time in the computer because you only had so much time on the computer class. So I was, I was there in the morning. I was there in the evening. I was there anytime I can, I could get on this thing and just, uh, actually did a lot of game programming. Um, 
at the time, which was, uh, which was pretty fun, but it was all green screen, sort of like ASCII graphics. Um, yeah. And just took a liking to it. And then um, when I was, when I was a little bit older uh, and ran a bulletin board system, I didn't have the money for the, remember these 300 baud modems. I didn't have the money for a modem that would actually auto answer. So I actually built a system that um, I basically wired it into the phone system. I took the phone system apart and then built when, when the phone would ring, it would send voltage out. And then I basically reprogrammed the joystick port so that when it got a voltage signal, it would actually then just answer the modem. And uh, that was, that was my first foray into hardware hacking and connecting it all together. So I did a lot of fun stuff like that as a kid. So were you, were you always a white hat or gray hat and everything that you were doing? I mean, it's, you sound like a kid who's thinking around corners and, and figuring out ways to, to get things that people might want to, to um, I don't know, withhold. So uh, when, when you were in your other activities, whether it was sports, other things, was that same mindset active? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, so when I've been in computers a long time and it's always, you know, been on the good side of things. And I can talk about my time at Price Waterhouse where we used to get paid to, to break into computers. But that was as a consultant. Um, I think it's more curiosity. And when we think about hacking and, and the original term, the, the, the term is a bit perverted today. But when we think about the original term, hacking was, you know, people who were creative and came up with cool ways to you know, create new solutions. And it wasn't always, you know, black hat hacking like it is today. Uh, so when we think about the early players that were out there, I mean, a lot of it was just curiosity. And uh, I never really strayed off the, uh, the you know, the, the beaten path, uh, if you will. Um, and that's, you know, I got into consulting to get paid to break into people's computers, which, is, which was a heck of a lot of fun. But curiosity, I think, is the number one um, area that I was always thinking about how to do things differently, thinking around the corners, thinking about what's next and how do you put all these different pieces together where if you saw one sort of vulnerability or one aspect, like it may not be a big deal, but when you chain them all together, you, you know, you have a big problem on your hands, which is, which is kind of how the, the hackers think. Why accounting? Um, I, it, was there any kind of family or neighborhood influence or idea that, hey, if you can understand how money works, that's going to put you in a good position? I mean, I know that the, the computer business wasn't what it is today, but there's lots of things you could have chosen besides accounting. Well, I wanted a business degree. And um, and like I said, I didn't want to be a mainframe programmer because it, it wasn't as cool as it was today to, to program in, you know, all cloud technologies and everything else. So when I thought about what I wanted to do, I always wanted to have my own business. And I figured, OK, let me get a business degree. And, and the foundational language of business is accounting. You know, uh, obviously, I have finance courses and things of that nature. But just knowing accounting, knowing what a P&L is, knowing business models is really important. And it served me well over time. And uh, my CFO, uh, Bert Podbear, always tells the story about when I recruited him. And I said, hey, we'll, we'll never have a perpetual uh, you know, license because, you know, just it's not the right business model and everything is ratable and, and, and a recurring revenue. And it's, you know, he still, he still gives me a hug today for that because we don't have to deal with a lot of other things that companies have to deal with. So I think having that foundational kind of business background has allowed me uh, to go in a lot of different directions. And then obviously I spent a lot of time in the computer world, wrote a book on it. Um, so I know that the technology really well. And I think kind of blending the two is, you know, it's maybe a kind of a rare art, but I, you know, other CEOs that have a good business background and are really technology focused, I think have done really well. Uh, indeed. So I want, I want to go back to your um, post PWC and EY days when you started Foundstone, uh, what, October 99? Yeah. That's, that's not the best time to start a tech company, maybe. Um, what was your experience uh, starting something in the, the waning months, year or two of a boom time for tech? Well, in 99, it wasn't a bad time. In, uh, you know, April of uh, 2000, uh, it, was a, it was a bad time. So we got the company started. And, um, you know, really what I, there was a company called Internet Security Systems uh, way back when they got sold to IBM, but they were doing these kind of network scans looking for vulnerabilities. And I had been using the product and, and thought there should be kind of an enterprise version, uh, you know, something a little bit more robust. So 
uh, struck off with a few folks and started the company and um, uh, started in New Jersey. And the first office was in the basement of a lawyer that I knew I was a very good friend. And it literally, we just moved some filing cabinets out. Everything was broke down there and we just kind of set up shop. And that's how we got the company going. Got three and a half million um, as a first round and, and kind of the rest was history. But where it really got hard was in, in raising the B round. And I think a lot of founders today, it's been cheap money and fast growth and high valuations. And they, they haven't seen the, uh, the tough times, but we raised our B round at Foundstone in uh, 2001. I can tell you that was a really tough time and uh, we got it all done. And, you know, the company got sold to McAfee and it all worked out. But, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned there that that I take forward today in terms of thinking about preservation of cash, cash flow generation, not getting too ahead of your skis on, in terms of like valuation and, and uh, as a private company. So, um Anyway, that's that's a little bit about Foundstone. Uh, it was it was a fun run, and it was uh, you know a lot of lessons learned um, that you just try to carry forward in, in you know your other companies and other ventures. Well, give me a little condensed version because it's really uh, topical given what's happening in the market now. Did you have to do a down round at, at some point, or um, did the customer momentum kind of get hit as so many companies? either went away or shrank during that post 2000 period? We, we didn't have to do a down round, although I specifically remember we had to do like this crazy warrant that was attached to the B round. And it was, it was super annoying um, because the accounting for warrants, they're just like, until you actually exercise them, it just, you know, it's always sort of a, a bit of a guessing game on, what it cost. And, and then when we ultimately sold to McAfee, there was a whole complicated calculation. So that was the worst that we had to do, but um, it's it still, like, it was like a noose around my neck to have this warrant because every round I had to explain it and it was complicated and it was just, it just didn't, we just need, didn't need to have it. Ultimately it, you know, it wasn't a big deal when we sold the company. Um, but that's how we kind of crossed the bridge. We didn't, we didn't have uh, kind of safes and didn't, there weren't a bunch of convertibles and kind of complicated, not complicated, but, you know, esoteric type things that we deal with today, um, which are, are more standard fare. But um, I can tell you in 2001, we went through so many different meetings and, you know, it was just kind of a wait and see and all the money dried up. And um, I think one of my my favorite meetings that I look at now today, it wasn't favorite at the time we met with, with Venture uh, team in New York. And uh, we kind of, you know, that was my first company. So the guy in the meeting literally uh, went through all of the executives and basically said, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. And there was like one guy who we didn't cross out who ultimately left. Uh, he wasn't a right fit for us on the marketing side, but he had crossed everybody else's name out, including myself. And it was like, we didn't have enough experience. So I'm looking at him and I'm looking at his list and it's like, okay, dude, seriously, you want, you want me to take your money? Or you're just going to wipe out the whole executive team. So, um, you know, anyway, he wasn't the most successful of VCs, but uh, I do remember those stories um, because you, you tend to not forget those. That's, that's um, kind of amazing to think uh we've come a ways in a lot of investors anyway on, on founder control um, and, and engagement along those lines. So tell me about the McAfee experience. So you, you sold to McAfee and you stayed there for what a good six, seven years. Yeah. So we sold in 2004 and it was, it was a bit of a split. I didn't necessarily want to sell the company. They had called and they were looking for some, the technologies that we had and they were looking for, you know, people and expertise in this area because they were just, kind of a purely antivirus company. Um, but ultimately we put the deal together and, you know, in hindsight, it all worked out from a career perspective, but I didn't necessarily want to sell. Some of the other board members didn't, but kind of getting back to when we raised money and lessons learned that I took forward to, to CrowdStrike, and, and I'll, I'll come back to Mac here in a minute, is that um, we had a bunch of early investors in Foundstone that we were the only thing that was going to be worth anything in their 1999 and 2000 funds. And you know, whose wife wanted a new house and who was raising a new fund and all kinds of stuff that, you know, got in the way of making the right decision. Um, so my next company, CrowdStrike, uh, I said, I will handpick the VCs. I'm going to make sure somebody's got a view of the long game. 
so that we can build a meaningful public company. And, and, you know, here we are today, but getting back to Mac, they sold it, spent seven years there. I didn't think I'd make seven years, but uh, I was in various GM roles, ran things, you know, different groups and, um, you know, learned a lot on the sales side from the sales team uh, over there at scale. So I spent seven years there and I didn't think I'd make seven years, but I did. In the last two years, uh, I was asked to be the CTO and I, I didn't really want it because I didn't want to be just a tech guy because I was CEO and general manager and those sort of things. <clears throat> and uh, the guy I worked for us said, hey, just, you know, take the job, give me two years and, you know, we're probably going to sell the company. And ultimately we did. Uh, and but those that, that job that I had turned down twice turned out to be one of the best jobs because it gave me a much better appreciation for how broke the, the AV market was. And, you know, again, people were spending a lot of money on security, but not getting the outcome of stopping breaches. Uh, so I had sort of thought about all this stuff that we're doing at CrowdStrike. I went to Macme and said, Hey, I think we should do some of this. And they're like, Hey, we're busy selling the company and you know, that's great, but we're, we're, we're in the process of selling it. And I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll stay around for a little bit and then I'm going to go do my own thing. And, and that's CrowdStrike. So, uh, but it was, you know, I worked with great people, a lot of great lessons learned particularly on the sales side, the marketing side, and how to do things at scale, which again, served me well at CrowdStrike. Why did you stay so long? Is it because you were learning? It, yeah, it was. I was learning. Um, I think, you know, when you look at Foundstone, we, we got to, you know, a certain scale, uh, which is like small in today's, you know, by, by any means, today's standards. And then when you look at McAfee, there was sales and marketing and, you know, just all the different geographies. I traveled around the world. I mean, I circumnavigated the world probably three times and three different trips. I just a crazy amount of travel that I did meeting different people and just understanding, you know, selling security locally is different than selling it out of, uh, out of the, the U.S., right? You have to understand the partners, the network, how do you go to market, what the customer needs are, who's mature, who isn't. So I just kept learning and learning and learning in all these different areas, particularly on the sales side. Um, they, 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 they had a sales machine. So I learned a lot there. And, uh, you know, once we sold it, it was really the perfect time for me to go do something else. Even now in this down market as CrowdStrike, you've got like a $43 billion market cap, um, for any size, for any type of software company that's significant for, you know, security, it's, it's pretty huge. Um, did you, and anticipate that the idea that you had was of that scale at the time? When I started the company, I, I knew it would be big and bigger than Foundstone. I didn't quite know how big it would be. And, and you know, you got you to gotta go back to 2011 when people were, were, you know, I mean, I was first pitching on, hey, we're going to deliver endpoint security from the cloud. And, you know, these enterprises were like the cloud, that's scary. That's not secure. And that's, you know, we can't do that. We need the on-prem version. And uh, I'm like, well, there is none, you know, Salesforce doesn't have the on-prem version. So either, either do we. So I knew the cloud was bigger than CrowdStrike and, and this was the way to solve a problem um, in a meaningful way for a long period of time. I just didn't know, you know, how big and how successful it would be. You know, you don't really know when you get into it. And we just we were in the right place with the right people, the right product, solving a big security need. Um, you know, a lot of things went our way that we, you know, we take we took the time and effort to figure it out that were really hard, and we took the risk. I mean, there were a lot of people at McAfee and Semantic who laughed at the idea, like, "Hey, this is never going to work." Um, you know, and a lot of those guys were sold or went out of business, or you know, I can go down the list of endpoint companies that are gone now uh, since we started. So. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great success, and uh, I still think we're in the early innings of what we're doing at CrowdStrike. So um, I, I always like to ask about an experience I call Death Valley, the lowest point, because I think there's a lot of uh, learning that comes from how you get through that. So um, particularly in the CrowdStrike journey, perhaps, um, what what has that been? Have there been any point where you thought you had hit a wall and maybe the whole thing just wasn't going to work out. We uh, candidly, we, we, there wasn't a time where it was like, Hey, I don't know that, that this is going to work out. <clears throat> there were plenty of, man, we got to figure this out and this is hard and you know, something doesn't work and we got to redesign it. But there was never a feeling of like, this is just not going to work. Cause we had, 
we had so much interest. We worked with some of the largest uh, banks when I was starting the company. I mean, it was it was all there. And I think, um, you know, part of the biggest challenge you have is 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 sort of understanding the people that got you to a certain level uh, may not be the people that are going to get you to the next level. Right. And, and kind of changing roles and, you know, going through things that are really hard and complicated from a personnel perspective to kind of get to the next level. The, the, that was some of the biggest challenges I think that we've seen. It wasn't like the product wasn't going to work or the idea wasn't good. It was how do we, you know, how do we not shoot ourselves in the foot because we've got all the right ingredients to grow, but we've got to, you know, we got to make sure we've got the right product and the right people to get us to the next level. And, you know, the first 10 million ARR is different than the next 100 million is, nef- is different than the next billion. And you got to be able to, to grow and adapt the company. And that, that's probably one of the, the harder challenges that, that I've seen in, in running the company. Okay, then let me zoom out and maybe not just CrowdStrike then. Career-wise, what was the toughest point, moment, um, where uh, perhaps your, your intention, your dream, your hope um, had to get seriously reevaluated? I think it goes back to that B round at, at Foundstone, um, which is like, I mean, we, I can't tell you how many doors we knocked on and visited and just, you know, just pitch after pitch after pitch. And I kind of laugh today with, again, sort of how easy it's been for a lot of folks that start companies, um, you know, and we didn't know we were going to get the next round. And um, there was a guy that used to, to work for me and literally we had two weeks. This is at Fountain. We had two weeks of cash left to make payroll. And the, we were kind of in between that B round. And we thought it was coming, but, you know, there's always legal and got to get signed and everything. And I told him, I said, look, there's a big deal. Um, and, and the, the deal was actually Motorola who became a customer and an investor. Um, and I said, you got to go get this deal and you got to get them to prepay. Cause if you don't, if you don't get them to prepay, we're not going to make payroll. And he's, he said, okay, boss, you know, like he just said, yes. And somehow in two weeks, he got this big company to, to buy and prepay. Um, and they loved the product and they loved us that they, that they became an investor and made money on the deal too. They, they thanked us, but you know, we almost didn't make payroll and that, that was one of the harder times in that nuclear winter, which, you know, I've never forgotten because I think a lot of those lessons learned are really good for, you know, times of, of difficult macro backdrops. And w- what is the lesson then from that experience? Is there a core belief you derive from it? Yeah. The, the core belief is, um, you know, you, 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 you've got professor knows that, you know, nothing can be done and everything is a no, or you just, you know, you can figure out how to get to a yes. And I think in starting two companies and um, investing in a lot of companies that you, you got to have the perseverance and belief that you just, you're, you're going to succeed. And, you know, failure for us wasn't an option. Uh, for me, I've always said, there's no way I'm, I'm ever going to miss a payroll because that was, it is, and it was really a bad sign. Like you never wanted to go raise money and see you miss payroll or something. So I think that was one of those areas. It's just kind of, you know, grit and fortitude that um, no matter what gets in front of you, you're just going to figure it out. And there's a lot of people who wouldn't take the risk or, you know, would have been defeated. But I think, uh, you know, there's again, two types of people, possibilities and parameters. And, uh, you know, I'm in the possibilities camp and just, figure out a way to get to a yes. And that, that core belief has has, uh, served me well in just about everything I've ever done. Now, if I understand the timeline correctly, and maybe I don't, that difficult period is the same period in which you ended up picking up some investors who had uh, priorities that were not long-term aligned with the business, right? These are the folks who wanted you to sell, but this was also a difficult period economically for technology companies. So in retrospect, I mean, was there anything that you could have done or would have done differently? I mean, start raising earlier, grow more slowly. What, what could you do? Uh, There's not much you could do. I mean, you know, revenue cures a lot of ills, but um, it was the time. It was the backdrop. The VCs just retrenched. It was after the dot-com bubble. Uh, you know, is, are these businesses viable? Everything just went out. It was all clicks and eyeballs. So 
we were just caught up in the nuclear winter and we just had to survive it when we did, you know, and I, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, it all, it all worked out, but, um, you know, again, it was really difficult. And when I started the company, I mean, it wasn't easy. We were, I didn't take a, a salary for six months. I slept on a mattress in, in uh, one of the guy's houses in Seattle, uh, for our, we were working on our first customer and it was, you know, seven guys and each, each guy had a room and a mattress. And I slept in the, um, in the, the uh, dining room and the guy had no furniture. He was a bachelor. So I slept under the light that kept, kept me up all night. Uh, this is CrowdStrike I, you're talking about? No, no, no. This is at Foundstone. Oh, okay. I was about to say, I was like, at that stage you were, okay. no, 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 no. CrowdStrike was, uh, you know, we, we sold the company. We had, we had success before that. I didn't have to sleep on the, on the floor, but it, it, it kind of ties into that nuclear winter, you know, 99 into 2001, it was just kind of a lean period of time. And the A rounds weren't, 25 and 50 million they were you know two and three and you got to make the money last so um those are just you know kind of fun times i wouldn't change anything and and again i think you you learn a lot from the adversity that you face in getting these companies started and there's a reason why we're so focused on cash flow at, at crowdstrike you know and you look at our uh 30 32 percent um free cash flow margin i mean it's, it's super impressive for a company of our scale because it's, it's something we think about all the time. And it goes back to those early lessons of, you know, protecting and, and hoarding the cash. Yeah, makes sense. Helps you control your destiny for sure. Now, I, I want to now circle back to CrowdStrike itself and your vision for the rest of 22 and into 23. Strategically, with all the uncertainty globally, what's the most important thing? Is it uh, more expanding the customer base, um, the the modules per customer. Uh, is it is it you know geographic? Continued geographic expansion. What? Uh, it's it's all the above. I think uh, we've got a winning formula, which is get our technology into a customer, even with a couple of modules. We know we have a great uh, cross sell and upsell motion. We've uh, built an e-commerce platform behind the scenes, um, that way spend. Uh, three years on. In fact, the e-commerce team actually reports to me because I feel it's so important. And then um, it's, you know, continuing to get the module adoption because we know as we, as new modules get adopted, we get uh, larger uh, deal sizes. We get uh, stickier deals. We've got the highest net retention rates uh, that we've ever had. And they've always been high. Uh, you know, the last kind of public numbers are, that we put out are 98 plus in terms of net retention. Uh, pardon me, in gross retention, uh, not net. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, if we continue to do what we're going to do, we know at, um, you know, our customer count today, which is 17,000 and change, almost 18,000, that's a small drop in the bucket in terms of the total customers that are out there. So we have the ability to target the largest enterprises. We go down to the smallest SMBs. We don't sell to the consumer today. Um, but there's a lot more to go. And then when we think about the cloud opportunity that's out there, uh, it's really a, kind of a greenfield. So stick to what works, uh, continue to be really good in the areas that customers love CrowdStrike for. And uh, it's, a, it's a massive TAM. Uh, some of the numbers that I put out in our, in our public decks, which are on our website, uh, in the next couple of years, it's over $100 billion uh, total addressable market for the markets that we participate in. So keep executing and keep focused. And, um, you know, we got a winning formula. You said we don't sell to the consumer today. I can't help but read it. It sounds like something that your, your door is not closed to. You know, I, I think we always have to look at those markets. Uh, it's a different selling motion. We haven't made any decisions one way or another, but it is obviously a market that's out there. There has been strong demand from consumers they're constantly asking for our technologies. Uh, you have to be a business to buy CrowdStrike today, uh, but it's something that we'll certainly evaluate in the future. And, um, you know, again, it's kind of a different selling motion, different support uh, elements that are tied to that. But, uh, you know, we've seen in the past from other consumer type security companies that they're uh, cash flow machines, if you will. Um, but, you know, it's not something I would rule out, but it, it's not something that, uh, you know, we're doing today. Sounds like somebody with an accounting background who's maybe worked for uh, a security company that's done some consumer business before. Uh, George Kurtz, uh, I, I appreciate you bringing me 
up to speed on CrowdStrike and sharing your personal story as well. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to be here.